What is in the? Oh, that's my finger. <laughs> okay, you're the guardian of the camera. If it slips or falls or something, tell me. I mean, maybe it's like a dinosaur comes out this time. Come on! All right. All right. So you're gonna be able to hear my voice and see the slide, but I'm not really gonna stand right in front of it. Can be on camera. Okay. All right. So. Proteins are important because they build us and they make us work, right? Um, we've got enzymes and we've got structural proteins. We've also got parts of our DNA that code for things that aren't proteins. That's actually a new development. They, they didn't realize that there were some genes that don't code for a protein. They code for something else. Or this gene right here, once it's decoded, it will open up another gene that normally wouldn't have been opened. Kind of crazy, right? Once this gene is decoded and we get the product of that, it goes and attaches itself to this gene, and now we can decode this gene, which without this one, we wouldn't have this one. So it's kind of crazy. Do you know that 90% of our DNA is what we call introns? Introns are what they used to call junk DNA. They used to think it just doesn't do anything. They're starting to find out it doesn't work because there's lots of genes that are the same across a population and the only change between that population is what's in the introns. So if you end up with a Devon and an Abby and all of our genes are the same and the only thing that's different is the introns, are the introns drunk? Look at Devon and look at me. We're different. Okay, really different. Okay, so the introns can't be junk anymore. They used to say it's junk. We don't know what it does. It obviously doesn't do anything if we don't know what it does because we're super smart scientists, right? <laughs> Not the case. They're doing more and more research on these junk pieces and finding out that they actually serve a purpose. They're not quite sure what it is. Okay, so they're not, they're not quite that smart yet. But they're working on it. Okay, they're trying to figure it out. And now, what is RNA? What's it stand for first? Ribonucleic acid. Okay, well, that's really close to DNA. Is it the same thing? No. 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 Okay, where do we find DNA? Okay, let me ask you this. If I had the original Declaration of Independence, the original, okay, would I keep it in my purse and carry it around with me in Alabaster, Alabama, and throw my purse in a drawer, and take it out in the cold and in the rain? Would I get in trouble? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, if I had a copy of the Declaration of Independence, that I printed off Wikipedia. Could I keep that one in my purse? Yeah. Could I carry it out in the rain? Yeah. Could I crumple it up and stomp on it if I wanted to? I mean, if you wanted to, that would be kind of, kind of bad. But I could, right? Okay, so where does DNA stay again? nucleus. Does it ever leave the nucleus? Yes. Think about the Declaration of Independence. No. Would you want to take your original copy the full-on recipe and take it out into the environment into the atmosphere no. what's out in the cytoplasm deadly yeah. things enzymes <laughs> and digestive juices okay do you want to go expose your only copy of the directions to digestive juices no would you want your cell to vomit on your directions no absolutely not so do you think dna is going to leave the nucleus no. Now, there is one exception when it leaves the nucleus. When there is no nucleus. When's there no nucleus? Uh, oh. Prophase. 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 Okay, we're not talking pro versus you, but you're right. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, so theirs just kind of hangs out in the middle anyway. But in eukaryotes, the only time there's not a nucleus is when it dissolves during prophase. Okay? So technically, because there isn't a nucleus, it's not in the nucleus. So that makes sense. It's kind of a exception that doesn't really follow the rules. But while the cell is no normally functioning, if we were to let that DNA come out, we'd be in big trouble. Now, explain this to me. The Bible's a really long book, right? Yeah. Okay. The original copy of the Bible is written on scrolls. Yes. Okay. Lots of them. Okay, so if I wanted to carry the Bible with me, would I pile up all those scrolls like Gus in Cinderella and try and carry them everywhere I go? No. no. Okay. Don't you think that would be a little bit um, 
awkward. Clumsy and awkward. Yeah. Okay. So if I were going to read the Bible and I wanted to read the original, wouldn't it make sense to keep it in a really safe place and only bring out the part I need? Mm-hmm. If I'm on Job today, wouldn't I just put Job in my backpack and be good? Mm-hmm. Okay. So do you think it makes sense that when we need the gene for toenail cells, that we would go in and copy all of the DNA and then go make the protein for toenail cells? No. What would we do? We'd go in, just make the copy for toenails, and then take that copy out and go make the gene, right? That makes a lot more sense, right? Okay. You know what we're doing already. If you can understand that concept of I'm not going to take the really important document out of the really safe place, and I'm not going to take the whole big long document out when I only need a small portion. You got it. Okay, so let's solidify it for everybody. All right, so protein synthesis. This is the building of proteins following the instructions found in DNA. Where are the instructions? In DNA. In DNA. Circle DNA. Now, the instructions of DNA are found in the sequence or the order of the basis. So what's important to figure out what the instructions say? What's the important part of DNA? The order. Circle the word order. Okay? It doesn't matter that it's A's, T's, C's, and G's. That's great. The whole three billion bases are A's, T's, C's, and G's. What's the important part? The order that they're in. Okay? So here is an, an example of instructions. Does that make any sense to you? Nope. No. You know what the A's, T's, C's, and G's stand for, but you don't really know what that means. Now, if I swap this G and this A, am I going to make a different protein? Yes. I could, right? And once you figure out how to make a protein, you'll realize that sometimes it doesn't matter, and sometimes it really matters. Okay? So the order is a big deal. Big deal. Okay? This means nothing to you right now. By tomorrow afternoon, yes, you need to copy it when it says copy. There are a couple things where there's not like a blank. You just have to read it and fill it in. So after tomorrow, you guys will be like, that's three and a half words. I know exactly what that says. Okay? Today, you don't know the words. Totally cray cray. <laughs> you guys are so lazy. Your generation, you can't say crazy. You have to say cray cray. Okay. okay. It's actually longer. Yeah, yeah. cray is longer. Well, crazy is two syllables as well. So. Um, and my husband was subbing the other day, and some kid was in a tie, and he was like a tall black kid, and he was like, oh, you're on the basketball team? And he was like, I don't poop. And my husband was like, you mean you don't play basketball? <laughs> he was like, why can't, why, can't, why can't you just speak English? <laughs> so really funny. Because my husband's not, like, down with the street lingo. So. Well, he will be when he's in the classroom. But he's, he's not exposed to such young, hip minds like me. So I knew exactly what that I called it a I called it a twit the other day. I need to twit something. And I was like, and what did I say? I need to tweet to someone. And they were like, it's tweet at someone. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, sorry for the wrong preposition. All right. So, yes, you will totally understand this by the end of tomorrow. Okay? All right, here we go. So, why is this important? Well, proteins are going to make up the structure of a human. What's the important part there? What word do we use, circle? Structure. They also are going to control everything. So structure and control. You can circle or underline. I don't care what you do as long as you make something, some kind of big deal about those words. So it's going to be our structure. There are proteins right now that are holding me upright, that built my bones and my muscles and my tendons and my ligaments and are holding me straight. If I didn't have those proteins, I would be a blob on the floor, which might be kind of fun because I could like sliver under the door and stuff. But it wouldn't be fun when I wanted to like play soccer. The ball would just kind of like be buried in my flesh. That would be oh my god. Or you would need to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Like or I could like fling it like a big slingshot or something. Um, but it's also going to control all of our chemical reactions. Enzymes. Big, big deal. Okay? I ate pizza for lunch. And believe me, the cheese on that pizza needs to be broken down. Okay? You all know what cheese does to your diet, right? Yes. Cheese is like a cork. Okay? If you really like cheese, you'll realize when you get older, your digestive system slows down. 
Do you enjoy that 10 minute trip to the bathroom every day? It's not gonna happen if you're stuffed full of cheese, okay? Cheese is like a cork, <laughs> all right? If you eat cheese, you better eat some spinach too because spinach is like a plunger. Okay. All right, okay. That's, that's, all right. That's, that's Just telling you practical advice. As you get older, everything slows down. Okay, so all lay right. off the cheese. All right, so those chemical reactions, that pizza needs to be digested. If that cheese doesn't get broken down, I'm in a world of hurt come tomorrow afternoon, and I'm wondering when is my bathroom trip going to happen. Okay, so that bread, that bread is going to hold grains and nutrients that I need. It's not readily available unless we get all the way down to the individual molecules. There are enzymes in your body that are just going to come in and just shred it all up and take it all the way down to molecules and send these molecules this way and those molecules that way. And we get what we need because of those enzymes. There are enzymes in your saliva that start that process. If we didn't have the enzymes in our saliva that started to break down our food, you think you just chew it and mush it up. You're changing it chemically, even at that very first step. Kind of cool. Is that right? why if you like chewing gum long enough, it was deteriorating? Yes. Yes, that's why, and this is kind of gross, but that's why some moms that are feeding their kids um, table food for the first time chew the food up and then give it to the baby. Because the baby doesn't have teeth to mash it up, first of all, and their enzymes are probably not as highly functioning as the mom. So the mom will chew it up and start the digestive process, and then the baby can just so swallow like it. Birds do. Like birds do. Yep. My mom used to do it with me, with like hamburger meat and steak and stuff. She would do it to me. First, I had pizza mom. She kind of just fed it to me, and I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Now, yogurt, applesauce, you don't have to do that. That, was, that one's already been kind of good. All right, so some examples of proteins. We've got the walls of our arteries. Is that important? Yeah. Yes. Do we need strong artery walls? Yes. Yes. Arteries are pumping the blood everywhere in your body. Ligaments. <clears throat> we, we wouldn't have Jalen win first place in the track meet if he didn't have really good ligaments, really strong ones. Yeah. Okay? He wouldn't be able to pull that femur back to take another stride. Um, hair. <laughs> How awesome would it be? And think back to kindergarten and stuff. If when you got a haircut, that was all the hair you got. Okay, what if it didn't grow back? <laughs> we would all have some ugly oh, mullets God, right now. My hair was <laughs> Yeah, we would be rough. Those little bobs your mom thinks were so cute when you were little. You got bangs and hair shorter than your ears. All right. Fingernails. How, how often do you think about how important your fingernails are? I think about it all the time. I mean, what have I done today with my fingernails? I've counted papers. Okay. Some of you might count picking your nose as a pretty important part of your day. All right. Untying knots. What would we do? Peeling oranges. Peeling oranges. <laughs> exactly. Okay. There are so many things you use your fingernails for and you just don't think about it. Scratching. How unsatisfying would scratching be if you didn't have fingernails? You have nubs. How, how satisfying is this? Use your teeth. Okay. You're like a cat. What if you itch right there? Oh yeah, no. What do you That's have now? That's the cat. Yeah. Okay, so fingernails are important. Everybody knows how good a back scratch feels. Okay. If you have little nubs, if you were like a little frog without claws, back scratches would suck. Okay, be a waste of time. Muscles. Muscles are important. Okay. Go to the beach. If we didn't have muscles. Would there be anything to look at? <laughs> no. Okay. The boys would be way less attractive. And of course, and ladies, there's muscles under there, but we don't usually pump ours up as much. Um, and then bones. Important. <laughs> All right. And then antibodies. What the heck is an antibody? Isn't it it's what, something like, that heals bad things. Yeah. yeah. The bacteria. And it like keeps you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically there's a small misconception here. Um, it does work in our immune system to help kill things. Are antibodies um, murderers themselves? Murderers? Yes. No. No. The antibodies have zero murdering capabilities. Here's what happens. You remember when we talked about how cells have proteins buried in their membranes? Okay. And some of those proteins have little grabby hands on them. And it's like a lock and key. you got to fit the right lock to be able to fit in that. Okay. Well, an antibody is shaped like a Y, like this. 
okay? And it's got different heads on it, just like our little receptors on the outside of our cell. So when you get exposed to, let's say, um, chicken pox, okay, that's a good one, a virus, okay, the first time your body gets exposed to it, it takes about seven days before you start to register a response. What's chicken pox's response? Itchy. Itchy little red dots, right? After about seven days, your body has been able to identify the specific cells that are causing this reaction. And what your white blood cell does is it's going to eat one of them. Okay? Swag. And it's going to take this bad guy's head, and this is going to sound very brave heart. And he's going to spit it out and stick it on the outside of its cell. <laughs> Put its little head on a stake and stick it out on the cell. Yeah. And it's going to take that head on a stake over to the immune system headquarters and say, I need an army that can fight this guy. They did do that in very part. Okay, they did. They put somebody's head on the stake. All right. So, and they said another guy's head in the box. Oh, they so. did. I don't think I want to do this. Ray Park's my favorite movie. Yeah. I like it. Not for the gore, but because of the story behind it. So, they take this to the headquarters and they say, I need an army. Give me an army. Okay? And they say, here's what we need to fight. So, they drop that off. And the immune system does its job. It holds this army behind these doors. The white blood cells and the rest of the immune system fight it off this first time. So you end up with chicken pox for like a week, week and a half, and then you're good. Then you go back to daycare, right? And another little kid has chicken pox. And they want to share your truck. And you say, sure, because I'm a nice kid and I'm going to share my truck. And then you get, up, get exposed to chicken pox again. Well, big bad chicken pox is going to walk in and be like, Psh, I know this place, right? I'm ready to roll here. Get ready for the itchies, okay? <laughs> but as soon as your immune system registers, I know this bad guy, right? His face was on the milk carton. I know him, <laughs> all right? <laughs> it's going to go to its army headquarters and say, let's go. And all of these antibodies, hundreds of them, will come flooding out, and they know exactly what he looks like, right? Because we dropped his head off, okay? So all of these antibodies are going to go in everywhere on the outside of that cell, because remember it's 3D, everywhere on the outside of that cell that there's a little receptor, it's going to plug the hole. Okay, so this bad guy is now going to be mauled by antibodies. You know what mauled means? Yeah. Covered. Just attacked. Okay? The antibodies aren't hurting him. The antibodies are just covering those receptors so that he can't go attached to a good healthy cell and kick his bad germs in. So if you block all of those connectors, he can't make anybody sick. Uh -oh. But do we just want this sick cell floating around in our body? Oh, no. no, we gotta get rid of it, right? Yeah. So the white blood cell, what did he do at the beginning? Ate he ate the first guy and spit his head out. Well now, these little antibodies, they have kind of like a, a caution tape kind of signal. And they flag him down and say, woo, we got one. And so the white blood cell's going to come over and say, good, I was hungry. And he's going to eat them. And then he's going to go look for another pack of antibodies that's ta attacked another bad guy. And he's going to go eat that guy. So before they even get the chance to infect any of your cells again, they've already been taken out. Now here's the problem. What is outside every bathroom and on every teacher's desk? And on over, well, yeah, it's hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Okay. The more we use that antibiotic hand sanitizer and an antibiotic hand wash, the smarter those germs get. Okay. And they get to change and mutate some of their receptors. Now, it didn't happen in one generation. It might happen with one cell, and then it starts to replicate and replicate and replicate, and then we get a whole new strain. So, if chicken pox, it's been around a long time. What if it changes? Oh. Are you going to have an army for it? You have an army for the old chicken pox, right? I don't even have an army for that one. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but All right. Have the virus can stay in your body and give you shingles later in life. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a weird process how it all happens. Everybody thinks antibody's the bad guy. It's not the bad guy. Yeah, the white blood cells are the bad guy. They eat people. Okay. Yes, the flu vaccine is always changing. That's why every year you have to get a new shot. Yes. Okay, so do the white blood cells and the army of antibodies come back? Does the white blood cell eat the antibodies too? It can, yeah. It just, it, I mean, it'll digest and we've got hundreds of them, so it's not a big deal. All right, 
So, kind of side note, but that was kind of cool. You'll learn that in AP Bio, like step by step, without all the funny little comments. You'll learn the actual names and things. All right. There is there is a name for the head on the snake on the outside. That's not actually they don't actually have heads. Okay. All right. So you have to draw a picture. This is considered your primary structure. These are all proteins down here, but we have four different stages of proteins. The primary structure is going to refer to that original <laughs> sequence of amino acids. Remember, the, the order that they come in is, is big. Okay? So the original sequence, we think of it like a pearl necklace. Okay? If we were to take this top one and move it to the bottom, would we have the same protein? Absolutely not, because the order matters. Right? If I take this one out of the middle and move it up two spots, same protein? No, and here's why. What does hydrophobic mean? Hydrophobic. Scared of water. Scared of water. What is your body made of? 70%? Water. 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 Some of these are hydrophobic. Some of them are hydrophilic. What does hydrophilic mean? They like water. They like water. They like water. Okay? So if you hate water and you're living in a body full of water, do you think that when I fold, I'm going to put those pieces on the outside or on the inside? Inside. On the inside. So they will find a spot right here in the middle. If you are hydrophilic and you love water and you live in a body full of water, where do you think you're going to put yourself? The outside. Uh, the outside. So if we have two, this one and this one, that really hate water, they're going to try and crowd up close to each other and try and hide in the middle. And if we have two that really like water, they're going to fold the opposite way and try and stick out and get close to the water. We're going to do an activity tomorrow that shows you. I'm going to give you all the same pieces. And you're going to build your own protein based on the folds I tell you. Do you think they all look the same? No. They're all going to be different because of what interactions you have. Yes, ma'am. So do we need to just draw the primary structure? I think secondary is the other one on your list, yes. All right, now once we get this order good, then you've heard. The interactions with how that amino acid is going to play well with the environment or not play well with the environment will determine how it folds. And then we got to think about how it's going to fold on top of that. Because now if we have a hydrophilic here and a hydrophilic here, they're going to like each other. They're both going to want to be white water. So this spring is going to fold out this way. So that's how we get tertiary structure. Tertiary structure, you can see the little spiral that we created here is now here. These proteins are actually really, really long strands. So it's going to fold all on top of itself. And then quaternary structures, when we take a, a couple copies, usually two, three, or four, of that same protein and how they would interact with each other. Okay, so this hydrophilic part is going to go with another hydrophilic part on this other copy, and the hydrophobic parts are going to hide deep inside of this little donut. Does anyone know what we're making there? Red <laughs> Close. A red blood cell. Thing. See it? Nope. It's a little tube oh, light. Yeah, I can see a little it. inner tube. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. All right. I wouldn't have guessed that. But. So, proteins are made up of chains of amino acids. Amino acids are the little pearls on our pearl necklace. Okay? This is kind of side note here. Now, they're held together. I just said it's a little bit of a side note. These aren't exactly word for word on your notes. They're held together by peptide bonds. Peptide bonds just simply mean protein. Peptide means protein, so it's protein bonds. Um, they look like this, big long strands. Um, they're hundreds, sometimes thousands of amino acids long. So tell me, DNA is made of little bitty building blocks called what? Start with an N. Nucleotides. Nucleotides, okay? The order of the nucleotides is going to determine what amino acid we code for. Okay, whatever order A, T, C, and G is in, that's how we pick out the right amino acid. And I'll show you a cool little chart in a minute how we figure it out. If we have a big long strand of amino acids now, what have we created? The primary structure of what? A protein. Okay, do you see the chain here? DNA is made of nucleotides. The order of the nucleotides determines the amino acid. The order of the amino acid determines the protein. Okay? The protein determines what's going to happen in your body. Kind of cool, right? It's one big long stair step. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah, we're not there yet. All right. 
So these are examples of amino acids. They have really funny names. Alanine, phenylalanine, glutamine, valine, proline, lysine. You'll get real familiar with these. And it's okay if you can't pronounce them. Just spell them the, or just sound them out. Say them the way they sound. We'll play some bingo over the next couple days. We'll do a lot of stuff with these. Now, this is part of our hemoglobin um, gene. What is hemoglobin? Blood. It's in our blood. What do you got, Will? It's a substance in the blood that helps it bond with iron so it can carry oxygen. Okay, iron gives it its color, which what color is blood? Red. Red. All right. And on the hemoglobin, this is hemoglobin right here. Okay. On the hemoglobin molecule, we have different sites where oxygen can attach. So if you have a problem with your hemoglobin, do you have a problem? Because you can't carry oxygen like you're supposed to. Sickle cell anemia. Okay? Oh that is why this guy's in red. Okay? How do we determine the directions from DNA? How do we get the directions? The order of what? The nucleotides. So if we change the order of nucleotides, do you think it's going to change the order of the amino acids? Yes. It will. How many out of three billion letters that makes up your DNA? How many do you think we have to change to cause sickle cell? Like sickle cell covers your whole body, all of your blood. How many letters do you think we have to change? One. And it's not even a mistake, really. You go from having, okay, this is a small section. You go from having a T on the top and an A on the bottom. You don't even like mess it up. You don't even put a C there or a G there. You simply have to flip-flop sides with that one base pair. The T and the A are going to swap. That's it. Out of three billion letters, that's not even a mistake. To the naked eye, that will still look right because all of your complementary bases are the same. It's, that's all it takes. And the whole organism is affected. Okay? It's a really big deal when we have a mistake like that. Do you know what causes those types of mistakes, those flop mistakes? Exposure to certain chemicals. Exposure to UV rays is a big one. Um, the sun is responsible for lots of our deletion mistakes. So if you pull this out, what's going to happen to the rest of the letters? They all mess up. They all scoot down one. If I gave you a book to read, and I removed the 32nd letter and moved every other letter up. Could you read the book? No. No, because no. B would turn into here or her, and then every letter after that would be one off. It would totally jack up the book. You think it's going to totally jack up your DNA if you delete a letter? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you get skin cancer. Because the cell's no longer making a regular skin cell, it's making a mole or a freckle. It's going to be crazy. All right. Yes. Blood is never blue. I don't. I, I don't know who in middle school is teaching y'all that. I asked uh, Miss Wilbanks the other day who was teaching it. She was like, I don't know. It kind of gets there before us. So. Um, it's just how it looks. When you look at this, is really mis, mis like this is a misconception. The blue tint is from from the color of your skin interacting with the red. Yeah, that's why. It, it, but mine look really blue, okay? Your blood is never blue. Now, if you walk up on someone that just got in a car accident and they're spurting bright red blood, okay? That's from an artery. There's two ways you know. It's bright red, so it's oxygenated, and it's spurting. If it's coming out in a spurt, that means it's pumping from your heart, and it's coming out at every heartbeat. Okay, now if you walk up on a blood, um, uh, blood, a uh, car accident, and the blood is kind of darker red, like cranberry almost, and it's just kind of oozing, what do you think that's coming from? A vein. A vein, okay? Veins don't go with your heartbeat, okay? They're on the way back to the heart. That's too much, there's too much space in between the beat and the vein for it to come out in a spurt, okay? Also, that blood has already been pulled of its oxygen. So it's not going to be bright, shiny, and red. It's going to be kind of darker red like her sweatshirt. Okay? So not that I hope you ever have to encounter that, but just so you know. When it's spurting, 
That's bad. Put your hand on the it. Life yeah. Why do you put your hand on it? To pull, block like it. Just is there like anyone just 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 like like sell it? They can sew them back together, yeah. Oh. Yep, apply pressure. Okay. Now, you'll want to apply pressure to the vein, too, but it's not quite as important because you're not losing it as fast. Okay, but if it's an artery, bad deal. I had a friend, real dorky friend, um, oh, not the brightest kid I've ever met. He bought a samurai sword. <laughs> he had been to Shogun, or I think you guys call it Fuji here, or Sticks, you know, where they do the stuff. And he was really inspired. So he had this big samurai sword because he was like, oh yeah, I can do this. And so he was doing, in his living room, all this untrained martial arts. Oh, God. And he had the belt that goes with it and the little sheath that you put it in. And he was like, like this. You think he made it in that tiny little hole with that long sword? No. No. He went right in his leg. Yeah. Okay, so he said, and of course, don't ever do this when you stab yourself. He pulls it out. Okay, don't ever do that. When you've stabbed yourself with something or impaled yourself with something, that is blocking the blood from being able to spurt. Okay, leave it in. Okay, leave it there. Okay. So he pulls it out, and he's in like cargo shorts, okay? And he said the blood was coming out of his legs so fast that his pants were going... Uh, like this. Uh, it was pushing his pants as the blood was coming out. I feel like this is coming right back to my leg. Yeah, so his brother obviously was home and saw the whole thing go down, threw him in the back of a truck, and he filled, he filled the truck bed with blood, almost died. Okay, bad, bad deal. I bet that's um, really he is now just though. as stupid as he ever was because he survived. <laughs> I bet um, it's a really awesome story. And you know what he said in the hospital after he woke up, after surgery? You gotta take some nicks if you're gonna learn the tricks. <laughs> that's what he said. That doesn't teach you anything about going to do drugs. That's, okay? awesome. that's it. That's it. That's it. Okay, so in, in final statements, the shape of the protein is determined by the order of the amino acids. Okay, so if we have amino acids that don't like water, they're going to try and bury themselves on the inside of that protein. And if we have amino acids that do like water, they're going to try and find their way to the outside. And as we do the activity tomorrow, you'll get to see it a little bit better. Um, now, where does protein synthesis happen? So back on the notes. Well, DNA can't leave the nucleus. So do you think it's going to happen in the nucleus? Mm, doesn't really make sense to have to make a copy and take it outside um, if, if, if we can just have it, have it all happen in the nucleus, right? Do we really want to mix anything up with our DNA? No, probably not. We want to protect it as much as we can. So it's not going to happen in the nucleus. It's actually just going to make the copy inside the nucleus. Now, the copy we're referring to is that RNA. Okay, RNA is a disposable form of DNA. Remember we talked about putting an RNA primer on the lagging strand? Is it permanent? No. No, we kick it off in about five minutes. Okay? It's not permanent, it's simply temporary. So that copy that we make eventually is going to get broken down and recycled, and once again. Okay, to make more RNA of a different gene. Okay, so this is very, very temporary. It's just a, a momentary copy, and then we throw it back in the pot, mix it together, and use what we need next time. Now, RNA is going to carry those instructions out. DNA is like 3 billion letters long. That's a lot to have to carry. Okay? We don't want to carry that outside the nucleus because there's all kinds of crap outside the nucleus. So all we do is we make a copy of the section we need. Might be eyebrows that day, or if I bite my fingernails, it might be fingernails. If I like to pick my nose, maybe it's for boogers. Okay? So we take this copy, only the short section we need. Boogers are actually dirt and mucus mixed together. Really? Yes. Some people. They're just eating dirt. But I bet they have a really good immune system. <laughs> so we take those, that miniature set of instructions, just the instructions we need, that we don't care if it gets eaten by digestive enzymes, and we take it outside, and we go to where? What's our little protein-making factory we learned about? The ribosome. Okay? So it's all going down on the ribosome. Okay? Ribosome is where it's happening. Okay? Um, this is going to be out in the cytoplasm. Remember, I don't think you're ready for this journey. Remember that? Okay. 
Okay. Well, we're, out the jelly. <laughs> we're at the ribosome, we're at the factory, we're ready to roll. So, what the heck is RNA? We've talked about this. Ribonucleic acid, it's responsible for three things, three parts, okay? Because there's three types, all right? There's not just one type, there's three. All right, the first thing it's going to do is going to copy the DNA, okay? It's got to copy it. Second thing it's going to do is carry those instructions to our factory. What's our factory? The ribosome. The ribosome. And the last thing it's going to do is help put the protein together, okay? There's actually three different types here, and they don't correspond to the numbers here. They all have different jobs, but there's going to be three different RNAs that actually are involved here. If you're clicking your pen and driving me nuts. All right, so what is RNA made of? Well, what is DNA made of? Nucleotides. So do you think that if we're making a copy of DNA, we're going to build it the same stuff? Yeah, okay. All right, so instead of thymine, we are now throwing in a uracil, okay? Is the sugar and RNA the same? No. What are we using now? Ribose. Ribose sugar, not deoxy. What does deoxy mean? There's no oxygen on the top of it now, okay? And then how many strands is RNA? One. Just one. We only need one side. So deoxy doesn't have oxygen or ribose doesn't have Excuse me. Yeah, the, uh, I said it backwards. Deoxy is not going to have the oxygen on the top. Ribose is. All right. Only one strand. Okay. We're only making a copy of one side. Whew. Three types of RNA. Y'all know the first one. Most common. Messenger RNA. Okay. Messenger RNA is going to come in and open that double <coughs> helix just at the spot it needs and make a little copy. Okay. They're usually more than three letters long, but for this example, that'll work. All right, transfer RNA to, transfer RNA is not going to come into play until we get to the ribosome. This is kind of like a little taxi. So you remember taxi for transfer, all right? Its job is going to be to carry the proper amino acid to the ribosome. So when mRNA comes through and says, I need a valine, the transfer RNA is going to go, pick up the valine, and then come back and drop it off. Fast car. Okay, just like NASCAR. Yep, we knock out four of our teeth and we'll be good. <laughs> All right, and the last one is ribosomal RNA. This one's job is super easy, okay? Ribosomal RNA, this is the reason that lots of people don't consider ribosomes organelles, because a ribosome is simply a protein. That's all it is. All right, pack it up. We'll finish this tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.